Hey everybody, Mr. Murphy here. I'm going to be starting off with chapter 6, which is all about cellular energy and bioenergetics. So in this chapter, we're going to talk about a few things. Um, in this section, it's going to be kind of lengthy. It's a lot of chemistry terms and things like that. I'm going to fly through it kind of quick just because it's good to have a baseline understanding, but it's not going to be um, the absolute most essential sort of components of this. But it is good and uh, I think important stuff regardless, but that's why I'll move kind of quickly through the things that we don't need to pay as much attention to. Um, in this chapter, we're also going to look at, obviously, cellular respiration and photosynthesis. Um, the question for this chapter opens with, why does fresh air inhibit the formation of alcohol by yeast cells? Um, it, using some prior knowledge on this, you may be able to sort of come up with a, a fairly decent answer to this. It's related to the idea of fermentation, but we'll look a little more closely at the process, uh, how it pertains to larger cellular respiration, and we'll see sort of how the, the presence of oxygen is a, a cutoff point for certain things happening in the cell. So in this chapter, uh, we talk about um, energy with regards to this term free energy. And free energy is basically, think of that as the like potential energy that's stored in chemicals. And so something that has very high free energy is something that could be broken down in such a way as to f release that energy and allow it to be used in a variety of ways. And so y you'll see that come up a lot and it can be confusing, but um, a pretty simple idea. It's not free energy like energy that's just sitting there. That doesn't make sense. Um, it's energy that is stored in bonds and could be released. So I, honestly, it, you know, if you've had physics or you're aware of basic physics, I think the idea of thinking about it as potential energy, that, that is what it is. It's not inappropriate to use that phrasing. Um, I think that can be a helpful way of thinking about it. So there's sort of five principles here that are presented, and I think these are really great points that get at the different aspects that we should be thinking about. So the first one is just that chemical transformations are always a series of many steps. And this is often the part that during the Calvin cycle, the Krebs cycle, we look at and we say, we don't need to memorize all this part, right? And this goes hand in hand with the next uh, step as well, that these are reactions that are catalyzed by different enzymes. We at this point are aware of the fact that there are proteins swarming the inside of cells and that each of them has a very specific job and that there are many, many, many proteins. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that the process of photosynthesis, the process of respiration actually involves way more chemical specific little tiny reactions happening than we necessarily account for but it is important for us to be aware that those are sort of going on in the background the next one is that most metabolic pathways are similar in all organisms and this is such a huge point to sort of like a broader you know umbrella thing in AP bio of evolution and chemistry and the underlying or sorry and genetics and the underlying relationship between different organisms on the planet you know we talk about how cellular respiration is done by all living things it's not to the same extent you know eukaryotic organisms undergo a very different experience of of that process than a prokaryotic organism which lacks a mitochondria but at the end of the day pretty much all the the, the nitty-gritty chemical reactions that we just talked about how we're going to skip over those are all really the same um, and not just like the same goal like many of these reactions are precisely the same in a whole variety of different organisms which is a cool thing to keep in mind um, here's what I just touched upon the idea that eukaryotic organisms obviously very different because they have all these specific organelles that really increase the efficiency and then the last one is is always important to remember we talked about this with the cell cycle as well we can't pretend that this is just like happening it's all very carefully controlled and each individual organism or species uh, is going to have its own specific sort of adaptations to help maintain that that reaction process in such a way that maximizes its survivability. So um, while we will go into the the you know deep parts of photosynthesis and cellular respiration, also understand that there's a sort of other element layered on top of that, which would be maintaining a, a pretty fine control on the entire thing. Um, okay, so now some chemistry stuff. When we talk about reactions, there's some terms that are important to recognize and just to understand on like a basic level. The first pair of terms is exergonic and endergonic. And exergonic, I always think of as like an explosion. This is something that is releasing energy. It is energy just waiting to be sort of emitted and utilized uh, right away. And so energy releasing reactions, 
are then coupled with, on the other side, the energy requiring reactions. So in order to get the molecule that is ready to perform an exergonic reaction, we had to perform an endergonic reaction that required energy to be put in in order to store that energy in that molecule. We'll see more of this come up. Um, ATP, it, we're familiar with, is, is basically the energy currency of the cell, and the energy is released uh, the energy that gets released by ex exergonic reactions inside of the body is actually stored in the form of ATP. So ATP is actually mediating our endergonic reactions. And that might seem a little bit backwards because we always think about ATP as like the energy source, right? And so that might seem like it's going to just give energy. But really the, 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 the sort of explosion of giving energy is the breakdown of other molecules before it, such as glucose, um, which allows us to release that energy to then be stored in, uh, in, in, or be utilized in other ways with ATP sort of as the stepping stone. And we'll see some diagrams that'll help to make that a little clear. Um, this one kind of summarizes sort of some types of uh, uh, reactions that are happening related to these. So exergonic, which releases energy, cellular respiration, right? Taking these big molecules, breaking them down, liberating that energy, and using that energy to temporarily be stored in ATP. And then endergonic reactions, they require energy. So this would be like active transport in our cell. It requires energy from ATP. Now, that release of energy from ATP is exergonic, and it's being fed into an endergonic reaction here. And so it can get a little confusing because we sort of have these coupled um, very finely where the exergonic reaction here, it, that energy is stored endergonically in the ATP. And then that reaction of the ATP is exergonically releasing energy to be stored endergonically in the next thing. And so that's why it gets a little confusing. The net result, though, is that we exergonically release energy from our uh, energy sources, which would be like food molecules and things like that. And that is ultimately to lead to energy being stored in sort of the product thing that is being changed inside of the cell. Um, I, I think I, I probably just confused you more than helped you. But the good news is that as long as we understand those broad definitions of exergonic is, is energy releasing and endergonic is energy storing, we'll be in good shape. Um, there's, there's lots of uh, probably chemistry and biochemistry and good stuff like that in your future should you continue to pursue the sciences. And so you can get into the finer minutia of what the heck I'm talking about there. Um, here's a diagram of ATP. I feel like it's the world's most complicated diagram. They're just showing you how one phosphate makes it AMP, two phosphates ADP, three phosphates ATP. Uh, we'll, we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, so when ATP is hydrolyzed, and that is uh, we break off a phosphate group, it is exergonic. It's releasing energy. And so what you see here is this delta G. This is the it's what's called Gibbs free energy. Um, this is a release of energy. So you notice that it, it is a loss of energy for the ATP molecule because it's releasing a certain measurement of energy, uh, which could then be doing something. Um, and that's uh, that's sort of the function of the cell, right? Is doing something with that. So um, there's a few diagrams here which help you to maybe understand a little bit more about what's going on with ATP. Um, the, the thing to remember is that the, um, the phosphate groups have a much higher energy storage between them in these bonds that are between the individual phosphate groups than the phosphate group that is liberated in the little OH bond here. And so that's why there's, there's chemically more energy in this bond here than there is in this bond here. And that's why when uh, ATP breaks down, there is that loss of energy. Um, and that loss of energy is captured in a variety of ways or it is lost as heat, uh, which can also be helpful in certain organisms. Um, I think this is kind of a cool thing just to, if you want to know a little bit more, you won't be like quizzed on this, but these phosphate groups are negative and that kind of helps us to understand why ATP doesn't really want to come together on its own. These phosphate groups would be repelling each other just in sort of a neutral chemical pile. Um, they, don't, they don't want to get close enough together to actually form the bond between them. And so that's why it, it takes energy to create ATP. And again, that might seem backwards because ATP is our energy source. But remember, processes like photosynthesis are all about making... Um, sorry, that's a bad example. Processes like cellular respiration uh, are, are all about making molecules like ATP by taking another energy source. And so you take the, the bonds of glucose, break them apart, 
release that energy, have the right proteins and enzymes there at the time to utilize that, that potential and to change their shapes and to build these molecules of ATP. Uh, and that's why it requires energy to actually make the ATP, which should really make sense because the process of ATP, kind of like this diagram implies, ATP is all about temporarily storing one form of energy as chemical energy so that you can do something with it later. Um, and that's, that's how photosynthesis and cell respiration are ultimately coupled together. Um, so there's a, another chemical thing that uh, we should be just generally aware of, which is these ideas of uh, redox reactions, which is a coupled reaction of oxidation and reduction. So reduction is the gain of electrons, whereas oxidation is the loss. If you've heard about this in chemistry class, you may have learned the mnemonic oil rig, O-I-L, RIG, oxidation is loss of electrons, and reduction is gain. So it's a handy way to remember. It's I always have to pause and sort of like think through like oxidation. Okay, so oxidation is where it's losing an electron, and reduction is where it's gaining one. So when we see electrons basically moving from one molecule to another or being exchanged, we're, we're seeing the reduction of one molecule, which leads to the oxidation of another. And so here's an example of this, this thing which uh, contains some number of electrons. Now it's not just free electrons hanging onto the side of this. They're bonded to, or they're part of the interaction with a hydrogen or an OH or, or something. And uh, in this reaction, you'll notice that this thing is breaking apart a little bit, and its electrons are basically being liberated and shuttled to something else. And we've already seen this with photosynthesis. We'll see it with cell respiration. So um, it, again, it's not something that we're going to dive deep on. It's a you know broader chemistry topic. But it's, uh, it's good just to be aware of because the, the terms come up and it can be really helpful if you see something that's referring to a molecule having been oxidized or having been reduced just to sort of understand what that means in terms of, oh, it's reduced to a gained electrons or it's oxidized so it has lost them. Um, uh, this just sort of uh, highlights for us the fact that when you have a hydrogen atom, you can kind of think of that as being an H+, plus, which is a proton and an electron. Those are the constituent parts. And we see that a lot in photosynthesis and cell respiration that we capitalize on the, on the ability of a hydrogen atom to basically be ripped apart and to do things with those protons and with those electrons. Um, and so all of that is part of a redox reaction. And here's just a quick view of the fact that you have tons of free energy here in this methane, tons of ability for uh, this thing to, to um, be oxidized and, and uh, uh, lose its electrons to something else, whereas over here with the carbon dioxide, much less potential for that. So it is a much more stable, smaller molecule. It has fewer bonds that could be broken to uh, release meaningful energy somewhere else, which kind of makes sense why, you know, for instance, when you burn methane, what you get is water and CO2. And so that's, that's, uh, that's what's happening. You're basically having a jump of whatever the energy is of this molecule to whatever the energy of this molecule is, which is less. And that, that energy difference is what's released as uh, heat or whatever um, you know, the reaction happens to be doing. Um, throughout this uh, chapter, we'll see some different um, coenzymes and some different factors that, that we just kind of broadly consider to be energy carriers. And so um, NAD is one, um, NADP is another, and we see these uh, become reduced into NADH or NADPH, depending on if we're looking at cell respiration or photosynthesis. Um, FAD becomes uh, FADH2, which is again, uh, same, same deal. Uh, th these are the intermediate energy carriers that are associated with these different processes. Um, here's a little bit more about that, more detail than, than we need. But again, you can see how um, there are uh, electrons and hydrogens being put together into these molecules in order to produce their sort of energy carrying state. And that NADH could go on somewhere else to then um, be broken down back into NAD and, and H2O. And it's, it's very exergonic when it does that. It's able to release that energy to be used by the next thing. Um, another handy just diagram that shows both of these, that these are always coupled reactions. So, of course, when one thing loses an electron, something has gained that electron. And NAD kind of becomes this middleman step, kind of like ATP, or exactly like ATP. That's why it's another one of our energy carriers. And it uh, has one reaction that basically creates the NADH, it reduces it to NADH, and then another reaction where it's oxidized again and it has reduced something else. And so this would be creating sort of the next product in the line of that 
metabolic pathway. Um, the process of, of doing this is known as oxidative phosphorylation, which is a fancy term for basically powerhousing. Um, when we talk about the mitochondria being the powerhouse, we're talking about it being the site of oxidative phosphorylation inside of the cell. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so, uh, and so we can see here's just another example of coupled reaction. Um, the, the coupling that's happening actually here with um, the, the process, I'll go into it a little bit more, um, NADH donates its electrons um, and its hydrogens and, and uh, basically releases potential energy to be used by whatever it's reacting with. And then separate from that, that energy is being used ultimately to create ATP. And this is a process called ke uh, chemiosmosis which is basically osmosis or diffusion of protons. And we've already seen this with photosynthesis. And I'll show you this diagram here where, okay, so you have some oxidation event which is causing hydrogens to be moved across a membrane because of the flow of high energy electrons. And then those hydrogens, because they build up, they flow back out. And in that process could be captured by an enzyme like ATP synthase. And when they flow out, that ATP synthase is using that, that potential energy of that chemiosmosis that's happening here to create ATP. And so this should all start sounding a little bit familiar as, as we've probably discussed this topic with photosynthesis and, and will again with respiration. So um, just to sort of broadly speak about it, that's what the idea ultimately of what's going on. We're, we're separating out sort of these two chemical reactions and, uh, and using some proteins and things in the middle to sort of facilitate how the energy is getting from this molecule, which exergonically breaks down and then can be endergonically stored in the ATP to later be exergonically uh, released in the next thing that the ATP is, is doing. Um, and that, uh, that brings us to basically the close of this where um, this is just an experiment from the book. I think it's, it's cool if you take the time to get into it, but basically they just demonstrated that this was in fact what was going on and they, they showed how if they change the, um, the pH inside of the thylakoid, uh, by lowering the pH you're, you're adding more free protons, H plus ions, and by doing that um, without any uh, electron transport happening at all, so they remove, there's no like um, uh, actual photosynthesis, there's no uh, chlorophyll and things like that doing photosynthesis. Instead, it's just relying solely upon the injection of these these protons. And by doing that, they demonstrated <clears throat> that the low pH environment had a much higher production of ATP. Um, they did this using a molecule called luciferase, which is in fact named for Lucifer, uh, <laughs> as in like the devil. Um, and uh, I, I only bring that up really because I've seen it so many times on the AP exam. They just love the, the funniness, I guess, of luciferase. But anyway, it's a um, light emitting molecule that uh, is activated by the presence of ATP. So when ATP is present, it fluoresces, which then makes it really easy to detect the activity of. And so um, they actually had this setup where they were looking for that light emission, and that's how they measured the relative effectiveness. And so when there was a really low pH, they know that there was a lot of ATP produced from the flow, from the chemiosmosis, because of the luciferase lighting up. They go a little further and they show that if they remove phosphates, it doesn't work. If they remove ADP, it doesn't work. So like if they remove these various components that are stepping stone parts of the process, um, it, it shows much less effectiveness. So the question always comes up in class, you know, how do we know this stuff? And the answer is thousands and thousands of experiments like this that are so nitty gritty looking at and examining the tiniest little components, remove this protein, do that, do whatever and then see how the process works. And we can start to piece together, hey, when this thing's missing, uh, if the whole process breaks down, or if this thing is added, the process goes twice as fast. And then starting to narrow down what the component parts are, and then examining uh, you know, more closely like the structure of these things and how they facilitate the, the, uh, the activity. Um, but all of science really relies upon observation and then going back to the drawing board and saying, okay, if this is what we observed, what could explain this?
and we come up with a reasonable idea of like, well, if this thing's letting go of an electron and then it bounces through here and somehow changes the shape, we don't know how, but somehow changes the shape, then it'll do X, Y, Z. Uh, and then repeating the experiment in a variety of ways and demonstrating support for that. Or saying, oh, wait, no, it must not be that way because uh, we changed this other thing and it didn't happen. It's, it's a slow process. And it's one that thankfully we're entering into hundreds of years after, you know, science has really been doing its thing. Um, and so it's an exciting time to learn about science because a lot of it has already been done. A lot of the nitty gritty work has been done, uh, plenty to do, but it gives us the opportunity to sort of just jump in with like, all right, here's what we know. And uh, it turns out we know, we know quite a bit, uh, which is cool. Um, Excellent. <laughs> so this section just ends with sort of a, a, a reminder about um, respiration and photosynthesis, which are two big topics of the chapter. And um, uh, respiration is a catabolic pathway, and it involves the oxidation, the loss of electrons from glucose, uh, which is going to release that energy, um, so which is uh, overall extragonic, right? And then photosynthesis is the anabolic pathway. We'll get into what that means a little bit more. And that is uh, the, um, the taking of the constituent parts, adding in energy, and storing it as the carbohydrate. So that is a net endergonic reaction. Uh, and this diagram sort of shows the relationship between the two. Um, we'll see other diagrams that do that uh, as well. That is the end of 6.1. Sorry it was a long one. And next up we get into cell respiration.